she is in your professor here at Nissan Post Center. And she did have a PhD from IIC Bangalore. After that, she did two postdocs, one from Sukhova, Japan, and the next one is NREL in Denmark. And, uh, and she has also a list of uh, awards that she has uh, got. But some of the really important ones are like the Indian Academy of Science, and, and there are many more actually, Ramana, uh, But the one thing recently, she is the editorial advisory board member of the season actually. So I do not want to waste further time. She is really well known to see clear. Let's start your talk. And today she is going to talk about something which is kind of correlated with the previous talk that is using one year function to get insight into electron structure. Such a very nice introduction. And uh, Manurandra is not here, and if he's online, so thank you, Manurandra and Indra, for all the arrangements. Uh, so, with that, let me start talking about what I'd like to uh, tell you today. It's, this is related to some of the recent work which we've been doing, trying to use one-year functions to get insights into the electronic structure of milky. So I'll, I'll be focusing on a class of materials, which are the transition method I chose. And so I'll just briefly introduce these materials. Um, so what you can see is that uh, you they have this uh, uh, small unit cell associated with them. And uh, the reason I'm focusing on the unit cell that becomes here in a little time because uh, so if you look at this material from the side, what you see is that it has the central, each of these units of molybdenum diselenide, which is called one monolayer, has a central layer of the molybdenum atoms and an upper layer of selenium atoms and a lower layer of selenium atoms. Okay, uh, And if you look at it from the top, it looks like this hexagonal network, but uh, in, 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 uh, essentially each, each layer consists of these, uh, of these three layers. And if you look, if you focus on the molybdenum atom, what you can see is it's surrounded by six neighbors of selenium. And uh, these generate a trigonal crystal field, trigonal prismatic crystal field at the molybdenum side. So if it was just a molybdenum, I mean, just an isolated atom, the d orbitals would be fivefold each other. But because of the crystal field generated by these uh, selenium atoms, what happens is that there is a degeneracy lifting of these D levels. And what you have is that the lowest B levels is Bz squared. And so Bx y and Bx squared minus y squared are the next set of levels. And then you have the Byz and the Dxc. So um, this kind of a picture emerges from a simple treatment where you take the, uh, you think, uh, what goes for those unfamiliar with this among, uh, among the students, basically this goes by the name of crystal field theory. When you take the shape of the d orbitals, so just you know whatever uh, the y lengths they correspond to, you take that into account and treat the selenium atoms as just point charges and look at what the perturbation, how the energy levels change, and that's how you arrive at this kind of level diagram for this for this set of arrangement of uh, selenium atoms. However, is this uh, is this uh, so? What first thing we'd like to look at is this is the this is the picture that has it uh, emerged. And once again, I go back to one other aspect, that these materials have been very well known as solid state uh, duplicates, because each layer is, these are Van der Waals materials with one layer easily sliding over the other. And they're best known as you know semiconductors. So if I look at the molybdenum side, what I have is that uh, selenium over here has a two minus uh, uh, oxidation state associated with it. Consequently, molybdenum has a four plus oxidation state associated with it. You work out for, uh, work out what is the electronic configuration of molybdenum. It has it has a formal d electron count of two. So those two d electrons go on to fill up these orbitals, and so the, essentially the d z squared orbitals are filled up, and the d x y and the d x y minus y squared orbitals are empty. So this is a very simple nine picture. You can understand that even in this ionic picture. You can explain. Uh, you can explain this semiconducting state. Okay. So now, what we did was, I mean, just to tell you the nature of the states. What I'm just showing you is, I'm just taking the eigen functions of the Hamiltonian, and you know, uh, projecting out the character uh, of you know the MOS uh, 
character, the MOP and the MOD. And what you can see is this has very small weight and this has very small weight. And so as zero is my uh, is the top of my balance band, what you can immediately see is it's primarily these states which are involved in the electronic structure. And similarly, if you look at the selenium states, selenium S states are deep inside, whereas it's the selenium P states which are which are actually contributing on either side of your of your band gap, and the selenium D states are far away. So essentially, if I were to set up a type binding model for this system using one year functions. What I would do is I would like to I would use molybdenum B states as well as uh, selenium P states in the base. Doing this, what we did was we took the ab initio band structure, which is shown over here in the black line, and uh, we set, uh, we use the maximally localized Monier functions to you know uh, generate a tight binding model. And the and the uh, so you can see we have a good description of the band structure within this model. And the type binding is almost, you know, superposed this everywhere. Okay, so this type binding model has only molybdenum D states and selenium P states, and uh, it's these dotted lines uh, correspond to the uh, type binding band structure. Okay, so what does this tell us? So now I first looked at, and we have this very simple picture of the energies. So let me go and look at what are the. Uh, so I have a type binding description. So let me look. It has the on-site energies part and the hopping part. So I first want to look at the simple picture of you know, the uh, the energy level diagram that I showed you. So I go on to look at that. Oh, before that, uh, one aspect that I mean, when I'm looking at trying to look at the you know uh, uh, the atomistics of the model, uh, you know what you need to do is to ensure that your one year functions are actually representative of these atomic states. Okay. So for that, what you do is you you make sure that your spreads, this is the square of the spread, are uh, if you I mean I use what we use one year ninety in our group. So you must make sure that the square of the spreads is is pretty small because this is one point six one. So take the root of that as the actual spread. So those I mean essentially you it shouldn't be it's representing the atom and it doesn't have contributions on your nearest nearest on the near neighboring sides. So this is one. One thing that you miss when you're looking at an atomistic description, okay, you could have one year center, one year functions in the previous talk, so she was talking about it, which had weights on the other ones. But that's it. I mean, that I mean, if you're not looking at the as you're looking at an effective, uh, you know, description, that might be okay. But here we're trying to look at an atomistic description, and so in this case, uh, you must ensure that. And once you do that, let's look at the on-site energies which we get. So these are the selenium on-site energies. They are lower than the uh, you know forget about this. So look, the selenium on-site energies are less than the molybdenum on-site energies. But now look at this description. So among we had the dz square. It's this among the molybdenum d states. You have the dz square, and then you have the dxy and the dx squared minus y squared, and then you have the dxz and the d dy. So indeed, the simple picture. That I presented earlier seems to be, you know, reproduced by this. And this is what I had earlier: b z squared, d x y, d x y minus y squared, and so on. This seems to be reproduced by this. Next, what we did was well, let's take the band structure. So what we do is these are just for those who are not familiar with band uh, band structure and band dispersion. Essentially, we plot the these are just the eigen values plotted along different directions of the Brillouin zone. Okay, so high symmetry directions are chosen, and this is what is plotted. And zero is the top of my uh, is the top of my balance band. Okay, and uh, so what you see immediately, what we've done is we've we've just color coded it differently. So the contribution, the bands which have a d z squared contribution have these. Ha, I mean, so have have been color coded red, which with red representing the weight of the eigenfunction in that particular band. Okay, and uh, the those with the x squared minus y squared have been color coded blue. So immediately, what you see is that this band, I mean, if that simple picture that I presented earlier was to be true, then the whatever, I mean, even if once you have a band formation, the entire band should have dz squared character. Okay, and the next highest band would have been a combination of dx squared minus y squared and dx squared. However, the picture seems to be deviating even from such a simple thing. And what you have is that 
you have over here you have the dz squared character contributing whereas over here you have the dx squared minus y squared so in this region so this seems uh, this seems a little unusual and what is the what are the consequences of this the consequences of this are if i okay so so well essentially what is happening is that apart apart from the uh, near this neighbor interaction in the structure what you need to do is that these if you look at this uh, um, then the, uh, the second neighbors which is the molybdenum atoms you know this molybdenum atom with its nearest neighbor over here is also interacting and as a result of these interactions the second neighbor interactions those that's the reason why it's deviating from the simple ionic picture so what 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 effect does it have so if i i in my model i can selectively switch off whatever interactions uh, i would i want so what we've done over here is that this is the band structure which one had earlier i mean this is for the bilayer and what we did over here was we just switched off the second neighbor interactions and what you can see is this is my Fermi, this is where my this is the highest occupied uh, this is supposed to be this is my highest occupied band over here and you can see immediately that uh, you know the you have you don't have um, uh, basically you don't have a, a semiconducting state in the system what you have is it's becoming metallic essentially meaning that the sim there is a deviation from the simple ionic picture and even to represent it i mean to get to understand the semiconducting state one needs to i mean this one needs to bring in not only go beyond this simple ionic picture and this is what one of the uses what we can i mean this is one of the uh, things you can do using these one year functions to try to understand what exactly is happening and what are the hierarchy of interactions which are responsible for the electronic structure that you see in this system okay so far so good so now we move on to one um, to another class which is which is what which is what this inter interest in this class of materials has uh, you know come about essentially what these are are van der waals hydrostars van der waals materials essentially that means that the interaction between the layers is very very small okay so that's the reason why you can peel off one or more layers and you can in even you know you know in a very simple minded way you can put them with you know at very various angles uh, with respect to each other and so form these heterostructures so now what you can immediately see is that if i do if i rotate if i have one layer and i rotate the second layer slightly with respect to the lower layer i can generate these uh, so in contrast to the very small unit cell that i showed you at, right at the beginning what i have now are these very large heterostructures depending on the angle of rotation okay and this has this has been as so these mundane semiconductors which have been known for a very long time have suddenly become this uh, you know come and uh, become an active area of uh, of the of the net matter research these days because these systems now show very different properties uh, compared to what we had uh, compared to uh, you know compared to a simple semiconductor so what do you know about a semiconductor you have your valence band and you have your conduction band okay now suppose just think of it that i i can dope carriers into my valence band so if i'm going to be doping carriers into my so if my fermi level or was in the gap okay so, so your transport would be semiconducting and as soon as you move your fermi level into your valence band you have metallic trans you don't see anything you know unusual or anything different over there however what we see what is what has been seen and here i give you the example of tungsten diselenide which was from a, a, which is from the columbia group of uh, Cory dean and abhay vashupati so what they've done is they've hole dope they've doped holes into the val uh, into the valence band and as so what you have is as you're doping holes into the system you have these zero resistance states and then what you can see is that suddenly the resistivity increases and you have something like a semiconducting transport and then again you have these zero resistance states so this is something which is unexpected when you're doping into these materials so what is you know we want to understand what is what is happening in these materials i mean they were they're known to be uh, van der waals materials and suddenly you just twist or twist one layer with respect to the other and you get a lot of exotic physics so what exactly is happening in these cases so first before we go on to try to look at these complicated you know structures with very large unit cells 
the first thing we, we did was say, let's look at the unrotated limit. Okay. So you have one layer and you're putting the other layer. So basically that, uh, so you have, that is the bilayer, which, which we have. And the mono layer is what uh, is shown over here, the band structure of the mono layer. And so essentially, if the interaction between the two uh, layers is very small, then naturally it should reflect itself in the electronic structure. And so indeed we see that, that going from the mono layer to the bilayer, you see some changes in some parts. But essentially, the band structure remains quite pretty similar uh, for both these cases, which essentially says that if I have a mono layer and I'm bringing one more layer, there's a, there should be a very weak perturbation of the electronic structure. Okay, so then uh, this adds more to the puzzle of what is happening in the crystal structures. Okay, so before we go on to that, what I mean, how what are the interactions which change when I bring bring one more layer on top? So essentially, if I looked at the monolayer, I mean, we did the same analysis, mapping on the ab initio band structure onto a type binding model with the, uh, you know, in every case, the transition metal D states and the analog D states in the basis. And we did this, we did this both for the monolayer as well as for the bilayer. And what you can see in this case immediately is that uh, we have a good description in both these cases, which allows us to selectively, you know, play around with the parameters. And what we did is felt, okay, so, so let's take the monolayer band structure uh, and uh, on that superpose the bilayer. And the only thing that's happening when I have two layers is the fact that there are additional hopping interactions. There are, you know, uh, hopping terms between the two layers. Let me just switch off those, those terms. So we just did that. And the band structure is superposed on the monolayer band structure. So the bilayer, which is mentioned over here, has the interlayer hopping interaction switch. And you can see that okay, everywhere in the you know along all the symmetric directions, what we have is that uh, we the two superpose very well, which means that all the changes that I'm talking about are coming because of the interlayer hopping interactions. Okay. Fine. So so good. So so then uh, another aspect is which um, is that what we tried to do was also. Essentially, there are various ways the second layer can sit on top of the first. Okay, so there could be one which is this is it, these are the various normal features. You don't have to worry about that. But you think essentially, I'm just giving you I'm going to introduce you to a flavor of two of them, which is an atom on atom copy. I mean, atom on atom uh, configuration. So in this case, what's going to happen is that um, because the uh, you know the anion is sitting directly above this. Okay. Um, so these are, the electrons on this are going to feel uh, Coulomb repulsions due to the electrons on this particular atom, and as a result, they, this the interlayer separation see, is larger because of the steric repulsion because of this Coulomb interaction. However, if you come to this structure, which is a little bit staggered, what you have is that since they don't sit directly on top of each other, what you have is that in such a configuration, they, the two layers can come closer, and in this case, what you find is that the interlayer separation is about 3.2 angstroms. This is the projection. I mean, if you look at the top view of these uh, of these structures, what what they what structures these form. Okay, so when I look at each of these structures, I just considered one of them in the previous example. If I consider each of these structures and look and set up my type binding Hamiltonian and looked at what happens in these cases, so what you can just uh, look at is just follow. I mean, these are the different nomenclatures, and just follow follow each of these rows, and you can see that for each, this picture is you know valid for each of these configurations. And essentially, what we have is that in every case, what you what you're seeing is that uh, the on-site energies are not changing, and in this case, it's only the interlayer interactions which are dictating the changes in the electronic structure. Okay, so now then we went on to the next step, which is to try to understand whether we can quantify this interlayer interaction. And the way the way we went about it is to say that, OK, if I were to think of each of these layers as an effective atom in some sense, and what I want to do is to try to con construct a coupling um, between each of these layers and try to determine what how much that, what is the magnitude of this coupling. So that's what we went about doing. And the way we went about 
it is a process of downfolding where we are trying to integrate out the uh, you know the uh, high energy states so what you what we i mean essentially the process in this process involves actually dividing your hilbert space into two subspaces a subspace a which your which is the subspace that you are interested in and the other subspace is uh, the one which you want to integrate out and there are these of the ideal matrix elements which couple the two subspaces so essentially if we are doing this the way we would it's a, it's a kind of a perturbation theory where what you're doing essentially is what you um, what you would do is that suppose uh, so what you have is that these are your ideal functions u a and u b and you write out your expand out your um, you know, uh, you consider a particular eigenvalue associated with the A subspace, which which you're interested in, and then you expand this out. Uh, so what you have is it's just expanding this term out, and then what you're doing, what you do next is to, um, you know, replace the U B in this part, uh, um, okay, with this from from this expression. So essentially, this so. So that and ultimately you arrive at an effective Hamiltonian to describe this, uh, which has incorporated the part of B into this low energy Hamiltonian. And so we have, so now we are essentially dealing only with the A subspace. So we went about doing this and how did we go about doing this? So what we did was we just essentially for each of the monolayers, we set up its, uh, I mean, we, the, we saw the, we set up the type uh, Hamiltonian in the type binding basis. And then what, what we did was we solved for the eigenvalues. And for the bilayer, we set up the Hamiltonian for the bilayer in, uh, we set up the Hamiltonian for the bilayer in the eigenbasis of this monolayer. So now you see that because the, only the interlayer interactions are responsible, this is a very sparse Hamiltonian. Okay. And so, the, I mean, so then what we do is we then we, um, so then we carry out the downfolding and effectively uh, arrive at a low energy Hamiltonian that we're interested in. So essentially we do this as, I mean, so we do this in this case for the monolayer, uh, I mean, starting with the bilayer, the trilayer and the co-layer case. And what you have is with this entire process that I just, uh, I just described, we can reduce it to a, um, a smaller uh, Hamiltonian in each case, where this, so essentially you could think of this as one bilayer, I mean, one layer of this, uh, for the bilayer, it is this one layer interacting with the other layer with this coupling matrix element. So effectively, we have, an, uh, we can, by this case, by this way, we can extract out what is the coupling that exists between the two layers. Okay, and just to tell, give you a feel of uh, the, uh, you know, the, the approximations made are reasonable. So these are my, uh, the eigenvalues which we have for the, from the density, uh, the ab initio calculation. And in this case, I've given it for the, the effective model, uh, effective Hamiltonian that we've reduced to. So in each of the cases, you can see that we have a good, uh, we have a good description uh, within this effective model. And this was carried out at other, you know, high symmetry points also. And so essentially what we, we arrived at is that what, um, if you were to think about it, I mean, so what you essentially what we have is that if we were to talk about a coupling, so it's, uh, the nearest, there's an effective coupling between the layers, which is in the case of the first nearest neighbor coupling between the layers 0.312. Uh, in this case, and for all the systems, if you go to molybdenum diselenide, this coupling is 0.307. I mean, so it's a, essentially 0.31 EV. And for the, the tungsten disulfide is also 0.36 EV, and tungsten diselenide is also similar. So, and the next year is stable couplings. I mean, that is, suppose you had, you're thinking of a trilayer and the coupling between this layer and this layer, okay? That is much smaller, okay? And uh, so essentially, this was, uh, and this can be effectively neglected. So within this model that we have extracted out, 
what we did next was to say, okay, so now let me within this model, I we have a uh, we have this we've extracted this more uh, this kind of uh, simplified model for uh, that seems to be worth uh, for so we use this beyond uh, we've done it up to about we've done it to three mono layers and then this seems to be applicable we check that it's applicable to four mono layers also so using this model what we did was we we calculated the uh, band x trauma within the simplified model uh, up to about 10 mono layers okay and what you can see is that this is uh, We've done it for all the systems, uh, molybdenum disulfide, there is selenide, and still disulfide and diselenide. And what is shown over here is the variation of the band extrema, the CD conduction band bottom and the valence band top, uh, which is calculated within hybrid functional calculations. And within this effective model also, we've done it. And uh, even whether we take a three by three model or a four by four model, um, essentially uh, the, the range of the interactions which we include in the model. What you can see is that we are able to capture this description. Okay, so what is the purpose of this uh, if entire exercise? Okay, so now what what you, uh, when you go and, and you might have come across a lot of talks in, uh, on the semiconductor, uh, uh, for semiconductors, where what you see is that depend, uh, especially I'm taking this example of cadmium disulfide. So you can make spherical nanoparticles ranging from size of two nanometers to say eight nanometers. And depending on the size, you have their band gap changing. Okay, And this is their, this is the optical absorption spectrum, which you can see that, uh, you know, the band edge position, the absorption edge is shifting, which reflects the fact that the band, band gap is changing. So these materials show a size dependence, and that's what is expected. However, when you come back to these, uh, so effectively what you have in these, when you're looking at these, uh, you know, these heterostructures, even here you're talking about pretty similar size regime. Uh, so in this regime, you're still in a, you would think that there would be some effect of the sizes as a function of the material. However, because, so what we find is that in these Van der Waals materials, in contrast to these, you know, very covalent materials which seem to be showing a size dependence uh, and this size dependence is very material specific basically it depends on your uh, i mean the exciton diameter what you what manish was talking about in the gw so it depends on the exciton uh, diameter uh, the bore radius and so that that is a very material dependent quantity and however so in these covalent materials you have a size dependence of the band gap Whereas when you come to these materials, which are Van der Waals stacks, you are talking about similar size regimes, but you don't have, I mean, you don't see any size dependence in these cases, and almost beyond, say, uh, you know, three or two, four mono layers, four layers, four mono layers, your size dependence is almost invariant, and it's similar across the entire series of materials. Of course, now you could ask me a question. Uh, which I forgot to put that in the slide, is that the fact that if I were to talk about a confinement within the within this plane, okay, I'm just talking. I'm talking about a confinement in this direction, where I say that as I increase the number of layers, there is, I mean, there is no change in the band gap. Whereas if I were to I were able to grow, you know, uh, in a flake, for instance, if I were to able were able to control the size of the flake, okay. In that case, indeed, I would see a size dependence, the same as seen in the case of the cadmium sulfide and the cadmium sulfide. Now, okay. So now, what I oh, so essentially for this part, what we said was that we do we see a very small band gap variation up to about three to four mono layers for across the entire family, and this is because the size dependence is very similar because the effective coupling between the layers is pretty similar in all these materials. Okay. So now I go back, go on to the next story, which is of the twisted bilayers, where essentially what you have, as I said earlier, is that the upper layer is rotated with respect to the lower layer. And depending on this angle of rotation, your moiré cell size can change. So now, so since this, you can have some uh, very large unit cells associated with it, you can also have very small Brillouin zones 
I mean, this would uh, I mean this would automatically lead to very small Rinoa zones associated with these with these cells. So the question is because we I mean these are plain semiconductors and then we're doping into it and you see very exotic traces. So the question people have asked initially was should we just think of these as you know giant dispersionless levels because your Brillouin zone size is very very small and so is that the reason why you know the twisted structures have this strong correlation behavior? So uh, this is again the same uh, same uh, uh, what do you call it same uh, experimental result which I showed earlier and the aspect that Yeah, so the aspect that I wanted to show was that there is one little uh, one little uh, thing over here, which is that the, they see this zero resistance states uh, going into the you know the insulating states, and then again these zero resistance states for the, for this this is the particular twist angle that they have considered. But there's one more extra parameter which I didn't introduce earlier. They they seem to be seeing this in the presence of a, an electric field. So in the absence of the electric field, they didn't have this, you know, uh, they didn't seem to have this big uh, insulating state emerging over here at, uh, at a particular cold open concentration. But in the presence of this electric field, they seem to be having. So this is another way of showing the same experiments where what, you, what they see is that, for instance, this is your usual untwisted limit where you have the high resistance state, and then as your doping carriers into this carriage, doping goes into the system, you have the metallic transport at different angles. As again, so this is another way of representing this. Uh, so you have the high resistance states, and then you suddenly you have an increase in the resistance, and then a, in a fall. So this has been done at several different angles based on which the phase diagram, which I showed you earlier, was constructed. Okay, so. So the question is, by the description that I introduced earlier, these are, I mean, the coupling is so small, they've extracted a coupling, which is also pretty weak between the layers. So the question is, should we view these materials as, you know, uh, essentially you think of them uh, as the untwisted limit, plus some perturbation coming from you know, the interlayer interactions or some other interactions. Okay. So the we how should we go? So that that means that if I'm going to view, view this as a weak perturbation, my descript my description of the electronic structure should actually be a, I mean the primitive cell directions or primitive cell eigenfunction should be the uh, you know primitive cell eigenvalues should be my uh, should be the uh, should be a good enough description. And with respect to that, I should examine the perturbation of the of the electronic structure. So in order to do that, the way we do it, you can do it two ways. You can do perturbation theory two ways. You can either, um, you know, you can either take your perturbing Hamiltonian and find out its effect on the untwisted limit or the unperturbed Hamiltonian. Or the way we do it is since we can do a full-fledged calculation, uh, we um, uh, what we do is we take the eigenfunction associated with your for, for the perturbed or the problem or the moire supercell and project it onto the untwisted or the unperturbed limit. And this gives us a measure of the perturbation. Okay. So let's let's see what it would mean first by examining a simple supercell, uh, simple basic supercell. Okay, so what we did was we considered a, uh, a simple, uh, we considered an example of gallium arsenide, where this is the primitive cell of gallium arsenide plotted along the symmetry direction. And then what we did was we took a supercell con containing 16 repetitions along a particular direction. So in this case, what you have is along the supercell direction, what you can see immediately is that, uh, I mean, the band structure doesn't look anything like this. And you have a lot of lands which are, you know, almost dispersionless emerging. Of course, we know that, you know, just by going or constructing a larger group cell, we can't be changing the physics, right? The physics does not depend on the unit cell size we take especially when there is no perturbation, it's just a superset. So we should recover that, we should recover the band structure, which is shown here. So what we did is we took each of the ideal functions over here, projected it onto this, okay? So one of them, I mean, then it's, so essentially by this analysis, what we could do was 
this was the this was what I presented in the previous of the methodology in the couple of new graphs back. And indeed, by this projection method, we're able to uh, you know recover the uh, rec recover the band band dispersions along this direction. Okay. And the projection on the eigen on certain eigenvalues is is one. And so there is no uh, I mean so there is no project as there is no perturbation over there. Okay. So now we know that we have a scheme which works. Mm -hmm. So let's now go on to these materials. So we took a lot of one of these, uh, we took the, we consider this triangle of 19.03, which has a large number of atoms. It has, uh, it ha it's a large unit cell, which has a dimension of about 52 angstroms in one direction. And so it's, again, it's 16 times. I showed you the, I specifically chose the gallium uh result. I mean, over here, we take 16 times in one direction. This is also 16 times of the primitive cell that we had taken, OK? So we took this. And what we did was, at this particular angle, what we did was did the calculated the electronic structure for the for this twisted case. So the, the, uh, the dots over here represent the projection of, the, um, of each of these uh, of the moiety cell uh, eigenfunctions onto the primitive cell eigenfunctions. And we plotted the band structure along the gamma decay of the primitive cell. Okay. So what you can see is there are some uh, which have very little weight. It's almost, it's negligibly small. But focusing on these bands which have very high weight along the primitive cell direction, essentially, what you can see is that I've also shown you the uh, band dispersions along uh, for the primitive cell case. In this, you know, the solid line which is over here, and you can see that over, throughout the Brillouin zone, it almost reproduces the primitive cell band structure. So even at this very large angle, I mean, the very large unit cell that I have here, which should have a very small Moiré cell associated with it, I'm able to recover my uh, untwisted limit band structure. There are some small perturbations, but effectively, I'm able to recover. So the weight over here, as I said, it's almost uh, most of these have the complete weight of the Moira cell on the primitive cell. OK, so far so good. So it seems to be that there is hardly any effect of the electronic structure by this operation. So what's the excitement about at the low, low angle limit? OK, so, so well, then what we did was we looked at another angle, which is about, which is 3.48 degrees. And what we have over here in now um, is that um, what you can see over here are we is okay. So I should mention one thing that the untwisted limit in this case corresponds to one of them, which is known as two H stacking. Okay, and you see different types of stackings emerging. So if you look over here, the way uh, if you look if the top down view looks very different over here compared to the top down view over here. Okay, and this again is chosen. I mean, it's it's an angle which is chosen because it's in the range of interest. And the other reason for choosing this angle was the fact that it's, you know, the unit cell dimensions were uh, also, you know, are pretty similar to the other one. Okay. So unit cell and the number of atoms. Okay. So far. So what, so what do we do here? One aspect that we, we did the, we did exactly the same analysis uh, that I described earlier, but now you see some very different physics uh, emerging. You have some other, you have some, uh, at gamma point, you have some band which are dispersionless. However, okay, gamma point is not of so much interest because the valence band maxima at the, is now at the K point, which is much higher. And if you zoom in in this region, you seem to be seeing two bands over here, okay, which are crossing, uh, crossing at this point. Okay. So now if I, okay. I'll come back to this. So if I might remind you of the experiment, I told you that there was a small electric field used in the experiment. Okay. Uh, so going. So essentially what we did was we, we did the calculations. We introduced an electric field in this direction. Okay. And what happens in such a case? So what you see in this case is that, um, and this is what we had earlier. And what we have in this case, in the presence of an electric field, is that you have, I mean, you have the, uh, you have a small gap opening up here. Okay, there are several things that I need to explain over here. So 
So let me uh, pause a minute and look uh, look at what these um, bands, uh, these eigenvalues, which have been labeled A, B, C, D, actually correspond. So what we've done is we, in order to follow a band through, when you have so many band crossings, what you need to do is to follow its character. Its character cannot change abruptly. Okay. So what we did over here is that we plotted the uh, you know, uh, charge density associated with each of these points. And what you can see is that A, B, and B, okay, A, B, and B, all emerge, you have a bilayer over here. And all of them have their weight entirely on the, uh, on the lower layer. And the percentage over here tells you the weight on the lower layer, okay? Whereas the other band, which is labeled C, I mean, part of the other band, has its weight entirely on the other, upper layer. Okay, so essentially, if I follow through, I mean, I haven't shown the other points, but that's the way we, we join the points. Okay. So this is one band we follow, and this is the other band. Okay. So now you can immediately see why there is a, the electric field tunability comes. Because you can see that what does the electric field do? It introduces a staggered potential. Okay, or rather in your, you know, think of it this way, that your, if this, I mean, this is the bilayer. Okay, the electric field and Z is the separation between the layers. Okay, so the electric field would actually, I mean, there is no, because it's entirely localized, you can put your octagonal terms to be zero, coupling the two layers. And so the electric field is going to change your on-site energy of the of one of the layers by E dot Z. Okay, so this, and also the magnitude of the electric field is pretty much similar to the magnitude of the electric field which was used in the experiments. And essentially, it, it, what does it do? It brings it, you know, it leads to a. Uh, it just uh, separates out. I mean, so essentially, it separates out one of the bands with respect to the other. So at zero electric field, you have some multiple crossings of this band, and at finite electric field, you have, you know, you you don't have the crossings, and they are well separated. Now, what I do is, if I hold, if I had my Fermi energy here, it would be semiconducted. Now I'm I uh, you know I introduce holes into the system and move my Fermi energy through this band. So I have a high I mean a semiconducting state. Then I have a metallic transport. Again, when my Fermi level comes in here, I again have a semiconducting state, and again I have metallic transport. So essentially, with this, one is able to see and mimic what is happening in the experiment. Just to convince you of the same, what we did was we just took a much smaller union, unit cell where we were able to set up a one, uh, you know, do this analysis with the uh, using one year function. So again, uh, what we did was we uh, we took a bilayer and we uh, and and what we did was we uh, sorry, what did we uh, we uh, we did a one year mapping and we had the type binding Hamiltonian and then we again introduced. Uh, so we did that at the zero electric field limit, and then we introduced the electric field and calculated the Abinitio band structure. And just introducing this term within our type binding model, we were able to map on map out the Abinitio band structure in the presence of the electric field. Essentially, there's nothing more happening. There's also a, the you can use the map. What we've done over here is we've used the mapping onto one year functions to be able to understand what exactly the electric field is doing in our problem. So there is nothing more it's doing except introducing a standard potential, taking this example of a small unit set. Fine. So having done that, what we we could uh, we could um, explain the results that were seen experimentally. And there was another aspect that I wanted to uh, you know, uh, talk about, which is that uh, um, essentially like this. See, uh, the picture of the electronic structure that is emerging over here is that you have a flat band which is separated out from these dispersive bands. Okay, so that is the kind of picture that is uh, uh, emerging in these cases. And um, or rather, if you look at this side, it's even more clearer that you have these flat bands which are separated out from these dispersive bands over here. And recent experiments, which is, have also seen, this is on the twisted bilayer graphy. That you have these twists, you have these dispersive bands associated with the bilayer graphy, and then you have a flat band separated out. These seem to be supporting this kind of view in contrast to the you know giant molecule that I introduced earlier. This is the kind of view of the electronic structure. 
fine. So now I just I just have a few minutes left, I think. Um, so I'll just move to the last uh, another system or another example. I'll be talking about the twisted bilayer of um, molybdenum dye selenite at uh, at the same twist angle. Again, as over here, you don't see, in contrast to the very small angle that I showed you earlier, or rather this, uh, here you don't see any regions of high symmetric stacking. And effectively, uh, what you can see over here, uh, what you find over here is that we carried out the same analysis. And what we see is that over here, uh, this is the, the dashed line corresponds to my, uh, to my untwisted limit. And the over here, what I'm showing you is the projection <coughs> of the Moire eigen function onto the untwisted limit. Onto the untwisted limit is represented by the, the width of this curve. And you can see that essentially at this large angle, again here, I'm able to recover the uh, I'm able to recover the untwisted limit uh, band structure even for this case. Okay. However, again, when we look at the um, twist uh, at the small angle limit, uh, what we have is that we we seem to be again seeing these different high symmetry regions over here. Okay, and what we did one thing which I which I spoke of earlier is that when you have an atom on, in this case, we started on this AA or the atom on atom stacking. So they would like to, the layers, as I said, the interlayer separation has to be larger. Whereas over here we have, you know, a staggered type of stacking over here. And so the interlayer separation comes out to be you know, much smaller. So they, when, we, when we did the relaxation, indeed we found this kind of structure emerging, um, which is similar distances for, uh, were found for the interlayer separations of this largely AA and the largely, uh, I think, uh, largely A, A B prime regions as as found in these uh, in this high symmetry set. Okay, that is these are the small unit cells, and even over here, when you have a, something a region which is largely A, you know, this high symmetry type, even there you find this kind of similar kind of interlayer. Okay, so now we did the same analysis and. Again, uh, what we have here is that we have a band which is separated out from a set of dispersing bands over here. And this band has a very small bit associated with it. Although, I mean, what I should tell you one thing that although we are able to uh, capture the splitting off of the band, but the, there is also interesting physics. I'm sure there are more correlated phases, phases which are possible once you, if, once you examine the physics of you know, um, when you're examining the physics of this flat band alone. Of course, it's, this is, of course, not describable by just a single, a simple atomic function, but it has a much longer, you might need a uh, much larger length scale to describe the one-year function associated with it. OK, so fine. So now, how do we understand what is the origin of this flat band that is emerging? So as I said earlier, what you can see is that you know, what it's the interlayer coupling which is responsible for all the changes in the uh, electronic structure of the twisted structure. So essentially, what we did was we broke. So the interlayer the interlayer hopping interactions are dependent on uh, you know the effective distances. The signal, so it would uh, be the selenium selenium distances, um, which would be which would be in um, which would determine my uh, interlayer hopping interactions. So we did this. We did a profile of the selenium selenium distances at both 19.03, as well as this 3.48 pair. I've optimized the structure, as well as 3.48 pair. Again, at a fixed interlayer separation, we still had the flat band emerging out uh, that I didn't include over here. And what you can see is that the profile of distances over here in these two cases are very similar. Whereas we have no flat band emerging out here, whereas we do have a flat band emerging out in this case. So what exactly is happening in this case? So we did a real space profile of the distances over here. And what we see is that the, it's pretty random for the 19.03 angle. Whereas at the 3.48, you see you know, some regions where you have you know, a clustering of these shortest selenium selenium distances, which are, say, We've taken a value of about 3.8 answers. 
So you have reasons for the enha there's an enhanced uh, yeah, I just keep dancing. So uh, there are regions where there's enhanced interlayer interactions. And this actually this leads to this enhanced perturbation uh, and the flat band uh, emerges, uh, flat band is split off from the dispersing bands because of these uh, enhanced interactions. A similar, and this um, <clears throat> this profile of the interlayer distances uh, implies that there's enhanced interactions, and you can think of two layers. You know, there's one, uh, there's, in, uh, there's a hopping interaction between the layers, and as a result of which, you see that the charge density, when you look at the charge density profile, it's also something which is localized in this particular region. So with this, I'd like to finish uh, giving you some glimpses of how flat band formation is emerging in these uh, in these transition metal dichalcogenides, and also some insights into the electronic, how we use one functions as to give us insights into the electronic structure of these systems. And um, this is work uh, primarily uh, done by Sumanthi with contributions from Prashun and Unam, uh, which I described today. And some of the topics. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, sir. I'm sure you have many questions. Yes. Okay. Uh, Thank you for the very nice talk, ma'am. So, uh, my question is if, if from the very beginning of your talk, when you are constructing the one year function yes. and extracting out the hopping parameters. Mm -hmm. Okay, so from density function theory, we are projecting the orbitals. We are trying to see where are what are the orbitals that are contributing near the band minima and maxima. So, but from our DFT tutors, uh, they told us that these orbitals really doesn't uh, mean anything. But then, how we are extracting hoping parameters which are very uh, useful and uh, uh, like they are mapping something to real materials. So one one thing is I didn't do it only firstly I didn't do it within you know, so how I started out if I want to just do a discussion of the atomistics Remember that the way I started out is that what I said is that if I'm going to do a description of the atomistics, I'm not just doing the band extra mistakes. I'm doing actually in this case, we actually did the oh, we said I mean, uh, we said that look at the states which are dominantly contributing. So we took the molybdenum D states as well as the selenium D states, which are dominantly contributing on either side of the gap. And we use those. Those are the that's the character of the states. And we use those in our basis for the type. So that is the question. Like these these states that are coming from Ibanezio calculations, right? These these results. Yes. So uh, is it accidental that they really? Uh... Okay. So I mean, I guess the question is, I mean, it's not okay. Uh, there are problems with the deep density functional theory in the underestimate of formation of the gap and things like that. But it doesn't mean that the states are totally nonsensical. Uh, and, uh, uh, first of all, in the density functional theory, you the basis is the charge density, the density based method, right? But then what is done here is the projection technique, in the sense that the charge now are dividing which one belongs to molybdenum, which one belongs to selenium. I think this question is more related to the fact that they've been said that they've been told that you know so density the, functional so energies the, cannot be compared. Energies is different, but the thing is that charge density is now given some kind of the atomic description by projecting. This is exactly what she is doing here is a projection. So if you say it doesn't have any atomic description, that's not really correct because I'm doing a projection. Of course, there is a density which was all over the space, but then a projection is being made to give it an atomic description. So it's a post-processing that is being done. I hope that yeah, kind yeah, of yeah. clarifies. Yes, yes, thank you. So, I, I just thought of interfering because otherwise. Yeah, thank you, thank you. So I have another question with the twist system. 
So when you are rotating one layer on the top of another layer, does the interlayer separation also change? That's what I showed you in the two yeah. point four eight, where I do have like two different types of stacking. Okay, so in the in that case, right here. So there, I you know, uh, when it's atom on atom, it likes to be far apart. Whereas it's a staggered stacking, it likes to be. Uh, So, for instance, over here, so here it's atom on atom, so it likes to have an interlayer spe spacing around 3.74, whereas over here it is a staggered stacking, so it likes to be around 3.2 Thank you. Okay. Could I have any more questions? Go ahead, then we'll have another <laughs> Thank you for the nice talk. I am a little confused. And in your third slide, when you are showing that emo EC2 and emo is covered by 6 AC, and that is like octahedral. octahedral. Yeah, the arrangement of this is uh, is not octahedral, it's a different uh, look, point of symmetry. Okay, that, that is why the octa, uh, the crystal splitting is there. One is to two. Yes, yes. Okay, okay. it's trigonal prismatic, so okay. it's different. Yeah, Priya, what I was wondering, in these cases, there are two types of arrangement might be happening. One where it's forming some kind of a periodic structure, even in big practice units. But rest of the cases, it should be highly disordered. And when it is a disordered system, no, sorry, which one? Sorry, I when you twist it, yeah. the bond which is connecting, yeah. forming a regular pattern or periodic pattern will be like, very rare, I would say. So, so, so they can, I mean, basically, we, this is a very, I mean, you can choose which angle of rotation. Right? So, certain angles of rotation lead to smallish unit cells. Like this particular angle of rotation gives us about 1500 atoms. If you, I mean, something close by could lead to very large unit cells. So, they have that much control. And from PEM, I think they can talk about the size of this Moire cell also. So, experimentalists can talk about uh, so, a periodicity. So that means you have a 1500 bags. I mean, I mean, even if it is yeah, more than minimum, minimum, yeah, more than 1500 because each atom may have yeah, even if you take one bag, yes. one orbit of one this yes. So I was wondering, is it this flat band is coming just because the, some of the disordered states are highly good states? No, no, no. So it's because I mean the basic thing as, as I was showing you here is the fact that uh, the perturb when the perturbation is weak, for instance in uh, for instance, in 19.03, uh, at that the large angles, the perturbation, the, basically the perturbation emerges one source of the perturbation is the interlayer cup. When that coupling, you know, uh, is pretty randomly distributed, okay, and the perturbation is effectively small, in that case you recover the band structure of the untwisted ring. I showed you that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Whereas in the other case where the I mean you have strong regions of you know. A particular in some region, uh, like for instance, you have you know these, especially when you have these isometric stacking, you have some strong regions of perturbation. In that case, the flat band separates off. That is one of them. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so and rest of the, the band structure is very, uh, very much like the untwisted limit. Yeah, and it's also. I think uh, it probably didn't tell me. Probably that's what I was trying to say. Whenever yeah. there's a disordered system, yeah. which will be localized. Which will be localized, and that will make in case space it will look like it's a flat. Right? So this is not disposed. No, no, it just depends on where you put. I mean, both these are very similar size Moira cell systems. Right. Okay, but here the perturbation is large. Is large. Whereas in that case, it's a random disorder. It comes something random, you know, because your hopping in interaction strength is randomly changed. In such a case, it doesn't separate out. Whereas in this case, where you have localized regions patches. Where you have enhanced disorder, it separates. So, what I'm trying to say is these are aspects which are coming even from non interacting physics is enough to capture these aspects. Because we are, I mean, the ultimate truth is proof of anything is the experiment, and we are able to explain features of the experiment. Okay, there are any more questions? Yes. There is one, then I'm going to.
Hi, ma'am. Uh, thanks for the nice talk. I just have one question regarding the downfolding. Yeah. Where you uh, subdivided it into two spaces, right? A and B. Yeah. So A is your region of interest, and B is not. So does that whole technique depend on how you're separating these two things out? Yeah, but the, remember one thing what I pointed out is that here I have a very sparse matrix because I'm setting up the matrix in my eigenfunctions of, of the of the monolayer. Yes. Okay, so therefore it's a very sparse matrix. Otherwise, I mean obviously if I'm you know if these two regions are not well separated out, like and I'm you know it's like a perturbation theory. Okay, so when I'm folding it into that, then of course it would uh, I mean I have to go to much higher order, higher order. Yes. And also, I mean the favorite thing would not Hello. So uh, it's about density because whenever we do a calculation, so only thing we can talk about is the pseudo density, not the actual density, right? Because uh, we, we choose a pseudo potential, but we never make a condition that density should come out to be uh, orbital should be the actual orbital. Sure, but I mean, um, okay, like it's more like there's a lot of, um, but there, these, there's a lot of success of these approaches in capturing the atomistic aspect. And this, I mean, I would rather put the pseudo potential description of its transferability to different environments. Okay, because I mean, it doesn't depend on whether it's molybdenum 2 plus or 3 plus or so. The pseudo potential does, and it captures various properties of the system, which ultimately would depend on certain uh, you know, atomistics, right? I mean, it's able to capture your bulk modulus or whatever it is, or your cohesive energy. So, I mean, I wouldn't put it so much as pseudo. The pseudo potential is, has its success because it has the transferability to different environments. But that's just that totally yeah. fine. Uh, the only thing I am talking because about we are, because whatever density we talk, about, yes. But whenever we say about the electron density, mm -hmm. it makes a sense only after a cutoff radius because that's how we construct a pseudo potential. Sure. So after a cutoff radius, orbital should remain same, and it should be the same ion imbalance. Yes. That is the condition for it. So, so I'll say. So you're saying that I mean the in the. In the, I mean, it depends on which property you're looking at. Okay, so you, I mean, there are ways now of re reconstructing your core, right? With the projected augmented way, you can reconstruct the core part. Okay, I mean, if I'm talking about some transition of those core or something, it's different. But here I'm talking anyway about the balance charge density, which of course is, you know, you. Fermionity is close to the balance electrons only, and most of the physics properties are dependent on, on those electrons yeah. only. So that way it works very nice, except the gas, the band profile, and the fermion energy is very well captured by whatever. Okay. So if you have any more questions, please feel free to raise your hand, or else we will take the online okay. questions. Uh, how much the effect of the XC correlation function? How much the effect of the XC correlation function carries? Okay, so the exchange correlation functions would actually change your uh, what do you call it? It will change your band structure, and in that sense, you that that would be one primary effect of on your on your on your uh, you know, on your on your function, I mean, on the extracted parameters. So of course, band profile will depend too much on the <laughs> extrapolation function. I mean, you do. We do know that you know if you use LDA, the band gap is underestimated. But gap will be dependent, but how much the profile? The profile possibly will remain more or less. Sometimes, if you use hybrid functionals, the profile, I mean, you get your better effective. That's true. That's true. So in that sense, it's the band structure is affected, and so these are affected, but. So I mean, uh, if you get a better band gap with your with using a particular hybrid function, functional, that I mean, and depending on what property you'd like to look at, definitely your parameters are. Sonia functions are definitely not unique. You heard that in the morning also. 
Can you comment on its effect on calculated result? Okay, so, um, um, okay, I, um, I mean, obviously, uh, when I'm, okay, when I'm, um, I don't have a, I, might, I don't want to give a wrong answer uh, in the sense that um, largely, I mean, one has used maximally localized one year, one year functions and not maximally localized one year functions. And your, uh, at least your electronic interaction strengths, which are extracted out, are not significantly uh, different, is what I would say. Okay, so if there is no more questions, let us thank the speaker one second for his explanation. We will be over there, please. Yeah, it's all clear. Thank you very much. And we, we certainly.